The Go. broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, and thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm Dr. Steve Vargo, Optometric <clears throat> Practice Management Consultant with IDOC, and tonight's webinar is titled, What Does an Audit Look Like?, presented by Dr. John Rampakis. Uh, this is, I believe, the seventh in a series of eight webinars presented by Dr. Rampakis. And if you want to see the eighth, you'll have to hop on a plane and uh, come join us at the 2017 IDOC Fall National Conference at the Grand Hyatt in Denver, October 27th. And there's more information about that on our website if you're interested. And at that uh, conference, we'll be doing a Just Ask John session where we'll open the floor for audience questions. So we did that at a previous conference and it was very well received. Uh, the recorded version of this webinar will be available for 90 days on our website. And many of you may have heard John speak in the past. He's a industry speaker on billing and coding. Uh, John's also the founder of Code Safe Plus and Just Ask John, both IDOC member benefits. And we appreciate John's long-term term support of IDOC, and we greatly appreciate his time here tonight. So thanks, John, and I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great, Steve. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm going to uh, just start off by apologizing to everybody. I'm in a hotel room in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, and uh, have a bad head cold and uh, kind of got all stuffed up flying cross country today. But I'm excited about being here and finishing up this uh, series that we've started. You know, it's, it was really a great experience and sitting down with Steve and the leadership of IDOC at the beginning of this year and really talking about what we wanted these webinars to stretch out from. So we started with the basics on things like medical necessity and chief complaint and the healthcare environment. And we've talked about office visits and special ophthalmic procedures and surgical procedures. And we've done a series of seven of these and this is the seventh one. And I thought it appropriate that, you know, we would talk about because uh, I get requests all the time about what does an audit look like and what should I do if it happens to me? I think actually the more appropriate title should be what does an audit look like and what should I do when it happens to me? Because the, the chances of an audit happening today are is much higher than it's been in the past. And you'd probably say, well, why is that? What, what's changed in the audit, audit environment that's created that? Well, the number one thing that's changed it has been technology, number one. But number two, it's been the advent of the ICD-10. So remember that the ICD-10 really was a mechanism to be able to get much more specific about diagnosis codes. So, you know, little things like submitting a unilateral diagnosis code with a bilateral procedure that'll trigger a red flag, using modifiers inappropriately, things like that, those will trigger red flags. So I thought it would be good uh, to go through what does an audit look like and what should you do when it happens to you, uh, but more importantly, be able to glean out of this entire thing on how can you prevent uh, anxiety from you know encroaching on you uh, should you get an audit letter, because <clears throat> an audit doesn't need to be a painful thing. If you are preparing your practice properly, it's just a matter of, you know, checks and balances that really go on. As Steve said, you know, I do uh, consulting primarily. I do a lot of work with practice appraisals. I do uh, medical audit representation. So I do represent a lot of our colleagues when they do get audited, um, trying to help to minimize or eliminate any penalties that are coming forward. Um, as you guys know, I do a lot of uh, speaking for industry and uh, actually help to develop a lot of the policies that are surrounding much of the instrumentation that you use in your practices today. Uh, most of you probably know me from my articles that I write both in review of optometry, optometric management, ocular surface news, review and cornea and contact lens. And as Steve said, according, you know, for disclosures, um, I'm also the developer of CodeSafe Plus and Just Ask John. Um, everything that I talk about today uh, will be current as of today, September 20th, 2017. Remember, when we talk about specific policies, procedures, or guidelines, uh, those are also current as of today. But also remember that certain policies will change based upon where you practice. So it's very important <coughs> that, <coughs> that you know the rules in your geographic jurisdiction. And that's why I actually developed Code Safe Plus because it gives you real-time information that you can know what the rules, regs, reimbursements, all the policies, guidelines, definitions, what they are in your particular zip code. 
And that's the most important thing to know, right? We don't want to listen to people that are just spewing things out there and not knowing really what they're talking about or if they're not talking about it specific to your uh, location. So the very first thing I'm going to tell you is that you got to get the rule books, right? So all of these things that I'm going to talk about should not be foreign, right? These things are all written down. These things have been are all disseminated, but many times we just don't pay attention to them, right? So the rule books are, of course, the CPT book, the ICD-10, and the HCPCS level two books. Now, since this is 2017, I've got this labeled as 2017, but now all of the 2018 materials are available and you should really have those. Now, remember the ICD-10 for 2018 uh, becomes valid on October 1st, right? They don't, uh, the World Health Organization does not go on a uh, annual, annual calendar from uh, January to December, but their annual year goes from October 1 to September 30. So the 2018 ICD-10 codes become effective on October 1st. Now, again, if you want cloud-based real-time resources, we offer CodeSafe Plus to all IDOC members at a substantial discount. So that way you can get the benefit of real-time data. But again, you need the current rule books in order to play. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions about tonight's webinar, my uh, personal email is at the very top here, john at prmi.com. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have the only thing that I do request is that if you do ask a question about a particular policy or something like that, that you tell me in your email where you practice so that way when I email you back, I can give you a geographically specific answer. So here's the issues, right? So audits are created because people are coding things wrong, right? They, and, you know, what leads to that behavior of coding something wrong? Most of the time it's following the herd mentality, right? And, and you know, you hear a lot of people doing something and you say, oh, I'm, I'm going to do that because they're doing it. Or you hear somebody talking at a conference that they have adopted a certain behavior and you say, oh, I'm going to do that in my practice. You know what? It's important to know the facts and not follow somebody's opinion, even my opinion, right? My opinion's worth nothing. But the resources and the references that my opinions are based on mean everything. And the funny thing is, is that, you know, a lot of times it's economics that lead us to making bad decisions, right? We want to make, uh, you know, want, we want to enrich our practices. We want to make more revenue per patient. We want to do different things. And sometimes that leads to a behavior of perhaps you're doing something inappropriately, doing something too frequently. Maybe you're uh, avoiding calling something the right thing or you're misrepresenting a diagnosis, something like that, right? And the thing is, is that <clears throat> you have to understand that the healthcare system has shifted. Since 2014, there's been a Teutonic shift to where healthcare costs are really shifting to the consumer of the healthcare. Now, many of you don't want to have to have your patients pay something out of pocket, or you may not want to have to bill them for something that you're doing, and you're putting yourself at risk. Well, what I have to make sure you understand is that this shift in the healthcare policy, it's not your fault, right? You have to follow the rules for whatever they are. So you can't just arbitrarily do something. Like I had a doctor the other day tell me, oh, you know what I do? I take pictures on everybody because I think it's a great thing to do. And then when I find something, I bill it to their insurance company. But if I don't find anything, I don't bill it to anybody. Well, you know, we really can't do that, right? It's against all sorts of rules and regs. Now, you know, because a carrier could say, hey, you're being biased or discriminatory against us and, and then start an audit process on are you applying the rules equally to all parties? So there's a whole lot of things that people put themselves at risk for thinking that it's a good policy or a good trend or they heard somebody doing it. Right. And the other thing is this, is you've got a lot of people out there who hold themselves out to be experts. And I really question that. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of things that are actual things I've seen in just the last month or so. And this is just a good example. So this was on OD Wire, July 6th of 2017. Good friend of mine, Char Charlie McBride, practices up in Portland, Oregon, says, for those of you attempting to bill medical insurance to topography, you know, how does it how does it go? What does it look like? Right. And so the funny thing is, is that here was the answer by one of our colleagues out there. Bill it with CPT code 92025, diagnosis code, whatever the insurance company pays for. Next question. Now, we all know that that's not a right answer, 
right? We know that that's, I just can't put a diagnosis code, whatever the insurance carrier pays for. That's crazy. I'm now manipulating data based upon what's wrong with the patient. I can't do that. I am obligated by law to make sure that I'm representing what's wrong with that patient accurately. So again, right? We just can't do what you're, what you want to do just to get paid. So pay attention to things like that because those things really put you at risk. So for today, when we talk about rules and regs and what an audit looks like and what creates that environment, I promise you 100% transparency in that all of my stuff will be referenced. So you know it's not my opinion, but it's the rules and the regs that are out there. Okay. Now remember that we generally make it really, we make it harder than it really is. <laughs> remember that when you code something, all you're doing is translating the clinical care that you provided to that patient into a five character code for the procedure and up to a seven character code for the diagnosis. But remember, the patient's condition determines everything, right? It determines the level of history that you're doing that, and the history determines the type of exam and level of exam. Once you assess the condition, now you're obligated to provide a plan that provides the best outcome in the most efficient way that's concurrent with your local standard of care. So if you just follow those four bullet points, you'll generally be safe. But you have to make sure that you're recording all of your thoughts and your impressions, right? Because what you do with the patient determines what you write down, and what you write down determines the codes that you use to describe the care. Now, furthermore, when you submit the codes to the carrier, they're going to go back to what you've written down to determine if you've met the standard, you know, that you need to meet the burden of medical necessity, right? So the bottom line is this. The individual patient is going to determine everything that you do, and then what you write down is going to determine how you code those services because that's the only thing that you can use to substantiate your notes. Now, let's look at some foundational documents that really make a big difference, right? So there's two things. The U.S. False Claims Act, which governs what we define as fraud, and then each specific carrier contract that you've signed, right? Those provider agreements are actually legally binding documents <clears throat> that govern the behavior that you have to follow. So just because you have submitted a claim in error does not mean you've committed fraud, okay? In order to commit fraud, you have to have actual knowledge of what you're doing is wrong, you have to either deliberately ignore the rules or have reckless disregard for the rules. Any one of those three things, if you know what you're doing is wrong, if you're deliberately ignoring the rule, or you have reckless disregard, then you could be accused of fraud. Okay? So when we make a claim, a claim is a demand for money or pro property made directly to the federal government or to an insurance contractor, right? So again, understand that these rules govern everything that we do. So when you sign a professional agreement, when you sign an agreement with a an insurance company, remember it determines your behavior. It sets the standard or the bar for what you have to follow in your in how you deal with their members, the individuals that are paying premium. So remember that components of your provider payer relationship maintain that you have to accurately code and accurately bill and that you also maintain accurate records uh, of the medical encounters that you did. It also ensures that you're only billing for care that was medically necessary. And that word I have a lot of issues with because people do a lot of things that are not necessary, but they do them in order to cover their rear end. And then also making sure that you're never billing for services that have no benefit or outcome to the clinical case <coughs> at all. So let's talk about healthcare fraud for just a moment, okay? Who governs that and who determines that? Well, that's the Office of Inspector General. Now, for Medicare or the federal healthcare system, the Office of Inspector General is a police force that's out there. That's who you deal for, deal with. Remember, they are not there for our protection. They're to protect the public from us, right, <clears throat> when we're doing things. So the OIG's website is right here, 
I would encourage you all to go there because the OIG's website has a lot of information that's really uh, good and beneficial for us to look at. So when you go to the OIG's website, you can see how easy it is to report fraud. They just can click a button right here and it's just that easy. They have a lot of reports and publications that you can look at. They have a lot of different types of things. <clears throat> so that way you know what's going on. One of the most important things that I like is something called their work plan. And so when we look at their work plan, their work plan actually starts to tell us right here, it tells us what's coming up for the next year. They generally publish that in October or November of every calendar year. So also in the in the uh, presentation, I've given you the web link for the work plan as well. So that way you can go look and download it and you can see what they're going to be focusing on for calendar year 2018 to see what issues they're of, of primary concern. So typically it's the office visits. It's special ophthalmic procedures and it's misuse of modifiers. Those are typically the three things that affect us the very, very most. And the OIG is very serious about us providing worthless services, right? Patient services that provide no real diagnostic or therapeutic benefit to the patient. If we go back to 2014, everything has been related to a criminal conviction, right? It's pretty serious stuff. So what is a worthless service? Something that's not supported in peer-reviewed medical literature, something that's not medically necessary for a specific case or a specific ICD-10 code, something that's been furnished at a level, duration, dosage, or frequency not appropriate, for a specific patient or ICD-10 code, <clears throat> right? These types of things are very important. And you probably say, well, you know, I do a great job. I only provide the care that my patients really need. Well, I'm gonna show you here in just a moment how CMS and other carriers actually interpret this stuff. So remember, in our world today, from a clinical perspective, you base all of your decisions on evidence-based medicine, on based, you know, based on what does the patient really need and what's in the patient's best interest. The actual definition of medical necessity is this one provided by Medicare. And again, you can look up almost anything out there and you can find out <coughs> what your individual carriers require. Their definition will probably parallel this one very closely. What does this definition really mean? It means that the medical record must clearly demonstrate that the service procedure or test that you've ordered and performed was absolutely necessary in order to diagnose, follow the diagnosis, treat, or follow the treatment of a patient's condition. Now, how is a record going to know that? <clears throat> the records are going to only know that if you can record things properly. Okay. So this also pertains to office visits, right? So if you look at the bottom bullet point here, it says it would not be medically necessary or appropriate to bill a higher level of E&M service, and that means 92,000 codes as well as 99s, when a lower level of service is warranted. The volume of documentation, meaning how much you write, what level of history you took, all of that sort of thing, is not the primary influence upon which a specific code is billed. Your documentation should, should support the level of service reported, but you should only do the level of service that is appropriate for that individual presentation. So again, going back to your provider agreements, you are attesting in your contract that your medical records are accurate, complete, and show justification of medical necessity. Now that CMS 1500 form that we use to always bill our services, and whether you're doing it through a clearinghouse or your electronic form, whatever you're doing, you're still signing the very same thing. And what does it basically say? It says this, in submitting this claim for payment, and I'll just say from insurance funds, I as the doctor certify that the information is true, accurate, and complete, I know all the laws, regulations, and instructions available from the insurance contractor. I have provided or can provide sufficient information required to allow the insurance contractor to make an informed eligibility and payment decision. Now, bullet point number three says, audit me anytime you want, because I'm telling you that I can provide you the information you need. And then number four, this claim complies with all insurance program instructions. And then when you sign it, 
you're already agreeing to be prosecuted. OK, I just I, you have to know that when you're signing a claim, my signature is to certify that the information is true and accurate. I understand that any false claim, deliberate breaking of the rules, reckless disregard or actual knowledge of what I'm doing wrong or concealment of a material fact may be prosecuted under applicable federal and stark laws. This is serious stuff. This is a legal issue. <clears throat> it's not a revenue driven issue. So let's get into some definitions. Fraud is knowingly and willingly executing or attempting to execute a scheme or artifice to defraud any health care benefit program or to obtain by means of false or fraudulent pretenses, representations or promises any of the money or property owned by or under the custody or control of any health care benefit program. Waste means that you're overusing services or other practices that directly or indirectly result in unnecessary cost to an insurance program. Waste is generally not considered to be caused by criminally negligent actions, but misuse of resources. And then abuse includes any actions that may directly or indirectly result in the unnecessary cost to an insurance program. Abuse involves a payment for items or services where there's not legal entitlement to that payment and the provider has not knowingly and or intentionally misrepresented facts to obtain payment. So what's the big difference here? Fraud, criminal prosecution, waste and abuse, typically civil and uh, prosecution, okay? Big differences, right? Fraud is a big deal. Uh, and if when you are willingly and knowingly deceiving the, uh, an insurance carrier, each line on the CMS 1500 is worth up to $11,000, and they can do also triple damages. So again, something to think about. And they're getting much more aggressive on what they're doing. They're actually using a lot of technology now to go out there, and they can scan claims better than they could ever uh, before, and they're really going after individuals. So the current audit environment is pretty aggressive, right? <coughs> the federal government, has found a piggy bank, right? It's physicians and hospitals. And they know that their hit rate is really pretty good. When they're using technology, look at the type of return that they're getting. For every dollar they spent, they get $11.60 back, right? By using big data, by using data against you to be able to understand how they can get their money back. So, you know, it's it's a good program for the federal government, probably better than any that they've got out there. That's a huge, huge return. And, you know, these are not small things, right? When we start to look at these audits, they're, you know, even uh, optometrists, you know, $360,000. I've been involved in audit cases or decision making on what an audit penalty should be. And I've seen them well into the seven figures. That's right. Over a million dollars. Now, if you've got a million dollars that you can come up with, you know, within 45 days of notification, great. I know that most of my colleagues out there can't do that, right? So it's not small potatoes here. It's really serious business. <laughs> and they've also got the Medicare Senior Patrol, which is now paying seniors, you know, individuals age 65 and older to actually turn their doctors in. So there's a lot of ways that they can do that. Um, it's very straightforward. And they do get up to 30 percent as a whistleblower of a successful prosecution. So just realize that everybody is out there looking and gunning for us. There's monetary rewards. How do we present prevent these things from happening? Well, you have to learn information, right? You have to know what's going on with yourself. So there's a lot of different organizations that you can get data, right? So if I went here and I wanted to look at. I can't click on that link for uh, example, but I could go to uh, propublica.org. That's one of the sites that I like to go to. Let's see if I can do it here. And propublica.org looks at CMS data and, um, oh, they've changed the site since I was last on here. So, um, I should have been better prepared, huh? So anyways, but you can go on here and examining Medicare is where we would want to go. And then we can go to treatment tracker. And when we go to treatment tracker, 
what it does is, is you can look your name up. You can just type your name in right here, wherever it would be, and you could actually look things up. If you actually wanted to just see what's going on in your state. So let's say, for example, uh, I'm in Virginia today. So let's go ahead and just look at the state of Virginia. And I'm going to hit search. And it's going to go ahead now and pull up all the providers in, in Virginia. And I'm going to go ahead and click on optometry. And now it's going to tell me who are the major offenders. So it's going to tell me like this person here. I don't know who they are. Did 15,000 procedures on 845 people, 18 procedures per patient versus the state average of three. So it'll tell me what's going on. I can actually click on somebody and it'll it'll tell me in detail a little bit more of what's going on with that individual provider. It'll give me actually a breakdown of the different procedures that they do, how frequently they do them, all of that. So it'd be a great thing for you to do to be able to look yourself up and see exactly what's going on. So what are red flags that trigger an audit? Using codes that are under review, not reviewing your claims, abusing codes, inconsistent billing patterns, maximizing revenue without good documentation, not understanding definitions of modifiers or inappropriate use of them. The top three issues that I see, lack of medical necessity noted in the record for either the visit or special ophthalmic procedures, improper coding of office visits, and improper use particularly of modifiers 25 and 59. And the other thing is this, if you're instructing your staff to do something and it's wrong and your staff uh, pushes back, I want you to understand that everybody in the office can have individual liability. Just because they're an employee does not absolve them of that in that liability. Unless the staff writes a note down, puts it in writing, says, dear doctor, you're doing this wrong. I don't want to lose my job, but I'm making you aware that you're doing it wrong. And if you don't heed that, then they're putting themselves at risk and you at risk all at the same time. So let's look at what an audit looks like. Now, this is uh, one that uh, I recently worked on this year. You can see the date, June 29th, 2017. <clears throat> and it goes through and it talks about, you know, the decision, what are the summary of the facts. So I want you to see here what's actually written down. So when we talk about the facts, this is kind of what they look like. A claim was submitted for the closure of the lacrimal puncta by plug, 68761. The ophthalmic ultrasound, corneopachymetry, you know, gives the different codes and all of this, and tell us the different services that were done. So punctal occlusion, uh, uh, pachymetry, uh, looking at uh, osmolarity, right? Uh, doing MMP9s, doing an office visit. They'll also go through an OCT and all this stuff. So in other words, it says the services were denied because the information provided did not support the need for these services. That's one statement. Then they go into the basis for every single procedure. So for example, punctal occlusion. It says the records support the beneficiary has lacrimal plugs in the intracanulicular inferior side of both eyes. Although the record supports closure of lacrimal punctum by plug was actually performed on E1 and E3, the two uh, upper lids, the record is insufficient to support a history of symptoms associated with chronic dry eye syndrome, such as foreign body sensation, itching, excessive mucus secretion, dryness, burning, redness, or pain. The record documents tear breakup time is decreased However, this is not a quantifiable value. The records must contain evidence of the beneficiary's complaints normally associated with chronic dry eye syndrome, documentation of trial period of synthetic tears, decreased tear meniscus, punctate keratopathy, ulcers, erosions, early breakup time, oily tear film, corneal filaments, corneal scars of nodules, <coughs> or an abnormal shimmer. The reviewer is unable to determine a rationale for the service being performed, Therefore, the service cannot be approved because the medical requirements have not been met. So that's just one example. You could go on and they do this with every single test. So what you'll understand is that they go through every single procedure that you submit and determine whether what you've written down in the record is actually going to be uh, appropriate, right, for you to be able to bill for that. So that's what a CMS audit looks like. You probably say, well, gosh, you know, how about other carriers? Well, here's VSP. VSP says we're auditing you. You owe us $93,000. You did fundus photography that didn't describe the clinical findings. There wasn't an interpretation and report. You used the wrong diagnosis. 
interpretation and reports were missing, <coughs> you know, and we're going to charge you $7,000 to do the audit plus the 93, so you owe us 100 grand. So again, these things are pretty straightforward. So when you get audited, here's what's important to know. <coughs> Excuse me. When you get a letter, before you panic, you have to understand exactly what did you get, right? So there's different types of things. A heralding notice is one thing. It does not necessarily mean you're getting audited. This alerts that the, that the payer is going to be conducting audits across the system. Okay, that's important to know. Key questions. Should you get an actual letter of audit? Is the audit for recovery or for fraud? Is it an educational audit or is it a network-wide audit? Is the payer asking you for specific records? And how many records are the, is the payer asking for? There's a significant difference, right? If they're asking for quantity, you know, if you're getting 100 or more records, then they're probably on the trail of investigating something specific. Um, is the payer suspecting improper coding or billing issues? And then, of course, you have to be aware of medical necessity language uh, in, that's contained in your record. There's also types of audits that exist. Prepayment audits are automated. Postpayment audits are automated. Now, what's the difference between those two? So if you've gone through a postpayment audit, meaning that you've performed the procedures, you've uh, already got paid, now they're coming back to look at them again. That's a postpayment audit. We're looking at things retrospectively. If you generally fail one of those, or you have to say, gosh, we're not going to fine you, <coughs> but we want you to change your behavior, now they're going to put you on a prepayment audit, where they're now going to audit your record before, uh, before they ever pay you money. So that means you've already failed something at one, some point along the stream, right? So automated review audits are true. They also go through and they will take a look at known issues and then not pay you based upon what your records are showing. And the objective is to make sure that the claim meets all of the edits and the rules for payments within their system. Then you have a comprehensive review audit, a fraud and abuse audit, claim recovery audit, right? So there's a lot of types of things that they want to look at. Now, if you're getting a fraud and abuse audit, that's been elevated within the carrier, right? And if, you're, if your audit is being conducted by the SIU or what they call the Special Investigations Unit, it's because it's risen internally within the carrier, and there's a very high degree of suspicion that there's intentional fraudulent behavior, and the potential penalties can be much more significant. All right. Steve, I thought I'd ask to see if we have any questions so far. Uh, no questions. Great. Thank you very much. So what do you do when you get this audit? So generally what ends up happening is you get this letter, you communicate, right, back and forth with the carrier, but there's a lot of things that you really need to be thinking about. First of all, audits are a very serious issue and you need to treat them accordingly. First of all, find out who at the carrier is conducting the audit. If you can know the department within the carrier, it'll tell you or give you some insight on the level of seriousness of the audit. Number two, do not go it by yourself, right? Get some professional assistance. So normally I'm the guy that gets the call that says, help John, I'm being audited, right? So the very first thing that I do is I say, send me the material. We sign a business associates agreement so that way you can send me patient records so I can take a look at what they're looking at. And then typically, I shouldn't say typically, but many times I will help get you associated with a healthcare attorney, an attorney who understands your contract language and is familiar with the audit process, right? But you need to have a team. Many times you think that you can just handle it on your own. Here, I'll just give you the records and we'll figure out what happens. But you really may not understand the process behind everything that you wanna make sure you can minimize the impact on your practice. If the audit is for recovery or fraud, right, you want to be able to make sure you understand what the issue issues are at hand, right? So you want to get your team together. You want to assign somebody within your practice as the primary contact point for the carriers, right? And you want to create a depository for all communication 
and get your legal team and an audit expert in, in hand as well to assess, assist in building a good defense as you're doing this. So deadlines are the biggest thing that I see people uh, failing with. So as you saw in my disclosures at the start, I sit on the medical management committee for three different insurance carriers. And I can tell you the one thing that's the most disheartening is when a letter is sent out to a care, uh, to a provider and they say, you know, Dr. Smith, we need these 25 records. We need the 25 records within 30 days from the date of this letter. And we don't get anything back. So if somebody doesn't respond to an audit, it's a serious deal because now you're taking away your ability to actually work with that insurance carrier. You're giving up a lot of your rights because you're failing to comply uh, with you know, the rules and regs of your contract. So it's very important that when you have a deadline, make sure that you're well aware of that deadline because you give up a lot of rights if you don't fo you know, follow that. General time limits to pull your records is 45 days, but it is it can vary based upon your individual contract and your state's, your individual state prompt payment law. Make sure you assemble the information. Don't fail an audit because you failed to submit the requested information. <coughs> send copies, not the originals. Never send less than what the carrier is requesting. And then I'm going to add an additional bullet point. Do not add information to the record after the fact, we can tell when you're amending the record or when you're trying to add information to the record. Don't try to do that because it'll stand out like a sore thumb as you're doing things, okay? If an audit leads to a request for recoupment of funds, right, ask for time to review the demand letter, okay? Then the other thing I want to make sure that you're doing is making sure that you're doing a peer-to-peer -peer audit. So let's say you're an optometrist, right, that specializes in glaucoma. And the one thing that you're getting audited for is because your frequency of OCTs and visual fields is significantly higher than your optometric peer group. Well, remember, an optometric peer group can be a fairly varied definition, right? Who are you actually getting compared with? So one of the things that would be appropriate for your team to ask is, are you being compared to another optometry peer group that also specializes in glaucoma? And if they can't justify an optometry peer-to-peer -peer group, then you need to be asked to be compared against an ophthalmologist who specializes in glaucoma. Because now your frequency and incidence of certain procedures could look very much within the norm rather than outside the norm. So did, the other thing is, is you want to make sure that the insurance carrier is following all time requirements as well. Was a demand letter received with the proper time period following an audit? Was proper rationale and justification provided with an explanation of how they determined the recovery amount? So in other words, did they use good statistical analysis for how they hold the claims? Did they do a random audit? Did they focus on a particular ICD claim or uh, ICD code, excuse me, or CPT code pattern? Did the payer provide an explanation for each claim incorrectly paid or coded? So you saw in the Medicare audit they, that, they, that the amount of detail was uh, quite significant on every single line item. Now, it's not uncommon in a Medicare audit for you to get a letter or a report back from them that's in the thousands of pages, right? Why thousands of pages? Because for example, if they're looking at 50 records over a two year period of time, they're looking at all those medical records and they have to make a statement based upon every single procedure that they're denying. So again, was proper rationale and justification provided with an explanation of how they determine the recovery amount? And so, again, uh, did they explain their statistical sampling? Did they extrapolate? So extrapolation is a process of where maybe they look at 50 records, and the VSP audit letter that I showed you is a good example of that. They looked at 51 records, and they extrapolated against the entire patient base 
uh, of VSP patients that that doctor saw in their office, right? So if they said they had a 64% fail rate on fundus photography, let's see if I can pull that letter back up real quick. So <clears throat> this one here, right, the VSP letter. They looked at 51 records, 64% of them billed for fundus photography that did not meet the rules of medical necessity. So now what they did is they took a 64% failure rate and they extrapolated it against the entire patient base. That's how they got to $93,000. They didn't get to $93,000 by having, you know, uh, 51 fundus photos, right? <clears throat> so they extrapolated or made the penalty greater based upon your entire patient base. So you have to find out what method of extrapolation did they do. Did the payer provide information regarding your rights of appeal and the time frame and the requirements to do that? That's also a very significant thing because you have to know what your rights are under your contract. That's why a healthcare attorney is so important because they can make sure that your benefits or your, your rights are being preserved and you're not just running ramshackle. For example, right now with the VSP, uh, they, are, they do not allow you now to have an attorney if you ask for an appeals hearing and you go in. They used to allow attorneys, now they don't. They can have their attorney in, but you cannot have your attorney in the room. So what is the process of appeals? This is a Medicare process, okay? So level one is a redetermination by the company that handles your claim. So let's say you wanna go through, let's say Medicare audits you, you fail the audit, and you want to appeal it. The very first thing that they do is a level one is they send it back to the exact same carrier, and they ask for a different person within that same carrier to review <coughs> your claims. If you fail that, you are now entitled to a level two appeal, and that's a reconsideration by an outside, not within that same carrier, a qualified independent contractor. So another carrier that's not your own would look at those issues. A level three is a hearing before an administrative law judge. Level four, review by a Medicare Appeals Council. And then your final step is judicial review by a federal district court. Now understand that the burdens for each one of these go up higher. So for example, if I have failed a level one, and I need to go to a level two. What the level two is going to ask for is additional information that you have that you did not provide to your level one providers, right? It's not just the same information because the same information has already failed twice. So when you go to a QIC and a reconsideration, they're going to ask you for additional information that supports your position. And that's what's going to happen as you go to each stage of this the burden of proof that you have to come up with is significantly higher. So some of the key items to remember as you're going through this, make sure that you're providing only the care, right? If we're going to have to try to prevent this from happening, provide only the care that's necessary for the individual patient presentation on that specific day. If a patient comes in and let's say they're seeing uh, flashes or floaters and you decide that you're gonna do a whole comprehensive eye exam because they haven't been in for four years. So you do a refraction, you do a 92004 because it's been four years, technically they're a new patient again. And their only symptom was flashes and floaters. You probably didn't provide the care that was necessary for that individual patient. You should have probably done a problem focused examination only on their chief complaint of the flashes and floaters. OK, so don't provide more care than they require. Provide the exact amount of care that they require on that specific day. Make sure that you know, understand and adhere to the CPT definitions of all office visit codes. I always get asked, do I do a 92 or do I do a 99? It depends on how the patient presents. If the patient requires a complete evaluation of the entire visual system, then a 92,000 comprehensive eye exam is probably indicated. If the patient presents with a 
function or tissue specific type of a complaint, then a 99,000 code is probably the more appropriate code to use. Now, what level of that code you provide is going to be based upon the history that you took. And then that's going to guide you with the number of elements that you're going to physically examine. When you use modifiers, remember, modifiers are not just a tool to get paid for a, a, an encounter or a procedure. A modifier has a very specific legal definition, and you must make sure that you're using that definition and you're following that the use of them judiciously. Remember that you have a contract with an insurance carrier. If you don't like their rules, then you have to reevaluate your relationship with that specific carrier. Don't just break the rules, right? And if the funny thing is this, is if you know you're breaking the rules, now you've automatically gone into that fraudulent potential category. We want to avoid that at all costs if you possibly can. So how do you protect your practice for the future? <clears throat> Conduct internal audits on a regular basis. Now, part of my service that I offer, just as an example, I will come in and I'll, I'll ask for 10 or 20 records per you know per provider and we'll try to identify certain issues and that will tell us whether I need to do more of an audit or if that's just a good level right there but you can also conduct your own internal audits and you know that are fairly easy to do make sure that you have current rules that you're using current codes and you're following them properly for your geographic location Make sure that your documentation always supports the level of exam service being provided and that you're meeting the definition of the CPT codes. Make sure that the patient's condition supports the procedures that you've performed and the level of complexity that you've built. Scrutinize, scrutinize, scrutinize your records for statements of medical necessity. <clears throat> Many of us don't write that down. So I'll, I'll try to make it nice and simple. Make sure that you tell the record what you want to do with the patient and most importantly, why you want to do that with a particular patient. If you can do the what and the why, then generally you'll have your statement of medical necessity. Compare how you practice with your peers. Usually you're targeted for an audit because you're an outlier, right? You have unusual billing practices. You're doing way too many procedures like I showed you on that website of ProPublica, right? Also, patients can alert carriers, too. Why would a patient alert a carrier? If they get a bill that they don't understand or if a lot of testing was done that wasn't explained, that's generally what raises the audit specter from a patient or, you know, the patient concern. Then they go back to the practice or they go back to the carrier and they say, I think my practitioner was abusing the rules. They did way too many tests. On me, I got this bill for $400, $500. I didn't understand what it was for. <clears throat> Remember, once a patient initiates something, a carrier is bound to go ahead and investigate. So the best defense is a great offense. Understand the use of codes. Review your submitted claims. Learn how to use your CPT codes and their definitions to prevent abusing them. Avoid inconsistent billing patterns. Be consistent in what you do and make sure that you're charging equally across all individuals. So remember, the golden rule is one fee per CPT code. Don't ever discriminate by carrier or private pay. Everybody is charged the same thing for the same service. Make sure your documentation is perfect. Do not clone your documentation. OK, make sure that you're putting original entries in your medical record each and every time. Learn and understand modifiers and avoid inappropriate use of modifiers in your practice just to get paid. Remember, a modifier specifically describes a situation that is a departure from normal. And so you have to have a clinical record that also shows that it was a departure from normal. So I'm going to put in a plug for what we do from a technology if carriers today are using big data to identify you, how can you fight back using data and technology? Well, that's why I developed CodeSafe Plus. You can know every single rule, reg, reimbursement, 
ICD to CPT regulations, CPT to ICD correlations, all of those things you can know ahead of time, in real time, before you've ever provided a service. You can know whether a modifier is allowed or not, which modifiers to use, the definitions of the specific modifiers. So CodeSafe Plus is not just a tool to help you make more money. It does that too. I right? do a fee analysis program and understanding how you can, you know, get paid properly. But the most important thing about CodeSafe Plus is it's keeping you safe by understanding how to use the codes appropriately. And the best thing about it is that it's zip code specific data. So when you sign up and you have a subscription to it, it only displays the data for your zip code. So you know you're following the rules appropriately. Many of you have liked to have the one-on-one -on -one Just Ask John service. It's not an expensive service. If you're a CodeSafe Plus user, it only adds $17.50 a month to your subscription. If you get Just Ask John on, your, on its own, it's only $29 a month. And that allows you to have access to me 100% of the time to help you through any coding situations that you uh, would encounter. So either one of those, codesafeplus.com, IDOT gets one of the highest discounts that we offer. Uh, so take advantage of that. Or if you want a one-on-one -on -one service of Just Ask John, you can do that too, or have both. And with that, Steve, that's the end of our uh, information on audits and, and uh I thought I'd see if there's any other questions that have come up. John, there's no questions. Uh, so you must have either answered all the questions in the webinar or they're uh, too scared of getting audited now to ask any. But well, we don't hopefully, have any hopefully not scared, but just they have some good information to arm themselves now. They do. Very good. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for your attendance tonight and thank you for putting up with a guy with a head cold. Um, stuck in a hotel room. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to share the information with you. And Steve, thank you for IDOC support over the past year as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, everybody. Have a good night. Bye-bye.